All right, so in the second part of the acid-base video, we're going to finish up these notes. And so I'm just going to pick up where I left off in the first video. So hopefully you had a good little break there, and now we can keep on moving forward. So in the polyprotic acids, uh, when we see the word polyprotic, then what we should be picking up on here is the fact that there is more than one hydrogen that can be donated, all right, in order um, to increase the acidity of a solution. So something to keep in mind, let's take uh, H2SO4, for example. So this is sulfuric acid. There's the Lewis diagram. And we will say that this is hydrogen one and this is hydrogen two. So this acid, right, we know that H2SO4, S, we know that that's the acid. And this would definitely be polyprotic. It's got two H's. Now, it's always easier to remove the first proton than the second proton. And the second is easier to remove than the third proton. So just keep that in mind. Now, what we do in order to um, kind of examine that is we look at the Ka values. And we can see that like for sulfuric acid here, our Ka for the first one all right, is large. And then we look at our Ka, and we can see that it's a much smaller number, right? So it would be harder to pull that off. When we look at the pH of a polyprotic acid in solution, we really only look at the first Ka value to kind of figure that out, the first disassociation value. Now, bases, right, we look at weak bases, are um, things that don't disassociate all the way. And just like we have a Ka, we can also have a Kb, and this is called the base disassociation constant. Now, you're going to calculate the equilibrium the exact same way as we did for the acids, but now we're going to call it Kb because, obviously, we're looking at the Kb. So here you can see we've left out water because it's that pure substance, and we have our products on the top and our reactants on the bottom, just like we did before. We can look at a table full of base dissociation constants, all right? Um, they're going to be uh, tabulated just like our Ka's. The only thing to notice here is that now we're highlighting, all right, uh, in blue in this table, the element in the compound that is going to accept the proton. So if we look at ammonia, right, which is NH3, and it accepts the proton. So this is our ammonia molecule. And those two lone pairs are going to attack a hydrogen proton, and that's going to give us our NH4, which is ammonium conjugate. So there we are. All right, so that's how we would read that table. Now, what can we do with this? Well, remember when we did the ice tables back in the equilibrium discussion, how there were or there was a way that we could solve these ice tables using X, right? Using some uh, uh, what do we call it? Um, algebra. There's the word I was looking for. So in this case, we have a question that says, what is the pH of a 0.15 molar solution of ammonia? Well, we know that when you mix ammonia together, actually, let me take that back. When you see 0.15 molar NH, you need to think in your brain, all right, we took ammonia and we put it into a beaker of water. All right. And that is where we're going to get this side of the equation. We know ammonia is a weak base, so we use the equilibrium constant. And we then write the conjugates on the right. So we're going to take one hydrogen from water, and we're going to add that hydrogen there to ammonia. So that's, you know, our conjugates. And once I have that, right, once I can write this equation, then I can set up my KB um, expression, all right? And in order to do that, well, I need to go in and set up an ice table. I do know, um, just based on my starting concentrations and all what that's going to look like. So when I run my math, I get 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth is equal to x squared over 0.15 minus x. So I just pulled that right out of here. All right. I'm going to go ahead and assume, just like I did in the other one, okay, that x is going to be a lot smaller than 0.15. So 0.15 minus x is just going to be 0.15. We're going to assume this is a very, very, very small number. 
and so we'll just solve it out. We'll take our negative log, that'll give us the pOH, all right? In this case, we get 2.8, so 14 minus pOH is pH, and that gives me 11.2. Now, this is a little bit extra step compared to the Ka, so just make sure you understand that, right? We know that pOH plus pH has to equal 14. So we're using that to set up that last little expression there. And so that's how we might solve a KB problem there. Now there are two main categories of weak bases we want to be familiar with. There are anions of weak acids. So the anion of a weak acid is going to be a weak base. And then there are neutral substances like ammonia um, that have that lone pair of electrons that can accept a hydrogen. So Ammonia is the one that we talk about a lot, right? We know that if we draw out ammonia, it's a trigonal pyramidal molecule, and it has this lone pair on top that can go out and pick up some protons. So that's why it's a weak base. Now, there is a relationship between Ka and Kb, and it's going to wrap us all the way back around to the Kw um, value that we talked about in the first video. So Ka times Kb equals Kw. Kw is set in stone, right? We know that number. And so if we know Ka, then we can find Kb. If we know Kb, we can find Ka, right? So that is a really useful uh, relationship to know about Ka and Kb. Now, we are going to talk about salts a lot later when we get into um, electrochemistry. So just to kind of point out some things um, as far as how salts behave in an acid-base environment, uh, I wanted to look at these four points. Number one, all right, when you put an ion into water and it creates H plus and OH minus, we call that hydrolysis. That's a really common name for that reaction. So if you see the word hydrolysis in a problem, your brain should go, oh, I've broken apart water. I have H plus and OH minus. If you want to look at a salt specifically and say, all right, is the salt going to act as an acid or is it going to act as a base? you got to look at the cation and the anion that it breaks apart into to see how they um, behave. So the cation can be acidic or it can be neutral. The anion can be acidic, basic, or neutral. So let's break that down a little further. If you have an anion of a strong acid, that's going to be a neutral um, when you put it into water. So like Cl minus doesn't react with water, so we can't form OH from that, right? So does that make sense? Like think about that. Make sure that you understand what we're saying. So like if I put uh, HCl, which is a strong acid, into water, I get H plus and I get Cl minus. Obviously in there, there's water molecules, you know, floating around. And so we're saying like, do these two things react? Well, in this case, no, they don't. And so it behaves as if it's neutral, like it's not changing the water. Now, if you have anions of a weak acid, they're going to be conjugate bases, and conjugate bases make OH in solution, all right? So if I look at this um, example here, um, I believe that's acetate, and water is going to produce acetic acid and o, uh, hydroxide, right? H, let's see, acetate is CH3COOH, C2H3OO, yeah, so this is acetate. So acetate is reacting with the water, and it's forming acetic acid, and it's forming hydroxide. Now, if we have a protonated anion from a polyprotic acid, that's going to be where it can act as an acid or a base. So then we just look at Ka. So if Ka is greater than Kb, the anion behaves as an acid. If Kb is greater than Ka, the anion behaves as a base. So important, right? We've got to be able to describe some of those behaviors. Now let's look at cations. So if we have group one or group two metals, those cations are going to be neutral. That means when they dissociate, right? So if we have um, calcium hydroxide, when we put it into water, right, we get Ca and we get OH. The water, right, these two things don't interact. So group one and group two metals, they're neutral. If they're polyatomic cations, they're usually going to be the conjugate acids of a weak base. So if we make ammonium in solution, for example, right, 
Um, if you have transition or post-transition metal cations, so things like lead, right, like after the transition metals, um, well, they're going to be acidic. And the reason for that is there's no hydrogen atoms in those cations, like there's none there. So they're going to act as um, an acidic uh, substance thing. Now, we can make hydrated cations, okay, um, with these transition and post-transition metals. And so what's going to happen there is the water is going to attach to that metal. And the water, once it's attached, is more acidic than free waters. And that's what makes the um, hydrated ions acidic. So that's what's going on there. So we're looking at um, a weaker bond right here once these metal ligands are formed, right? These complex, um, these complexes are formed. And so this water molecule is going to be uh, more acidic than a free water molecule. That's what we're looking at there. And we're not going to really go much more into hydrated cations. It's good to know that they're there. It's good to be able to describe like what's going on with iron, zinc, and lead and that kind of stuff. But I'm not going to ask you any like crazy questions about these complex ion structures. They're interesting for sure, though. So back to our salt solutions, right? Can we put this all together? Well, four points. Number one, group one and group two metal cations with anions of strong acids are neutral. Group one and two metal cations with anions of weak acids are basics. If you have transition or post-transition metals, um, when we look at their cations, or if we have a polyatomic cation that has the anion of a strong acid, they act like an acid, they're acidic. And then obviously, if we have post um, post transition or transition metals and we have or we have a polyatomic cation with an anion of a weak acid then we're going to look at ka and kb whichever is greater is going to dictate what the salt is all right what the salt solution is behaving as all right are there factors that affect acid strength well of course so first all right the the hydrogen to whatever bond has to be polarized with a delta positive on the hydrogen atom in order for us to have, you know, that acid there, right? If you have a really weak bond between H and A, then it's easily broken. You can give up that proton easy, so that's going to be a strong acid. The second thing we look at is how stable A minus is, right? Our um, anion that is produced when the acid dissociates, when it comes apart. The more stable that anion is, the more stable the acid. So think about HF compared to HCl. Well, when I put HCl into water, I get this, right? Cl minus. And this is a pretty stable, um, it's stable in solution. But when I put HF into water, I only get very little F minus because F minus is not stable. And so since it's not stable, this is not going to be a, we are a strong acid. The other thing is think about the HF bond. Think about that bond compared to the HCl bond. Which one is weaker, right? This is a weaker bond. And we know that because fluorine has a higher electronegativity. So if we're comparing these two species, right, HF and HCl, well, the weaker bond is the stronger acid. So HCl is stronger and HF in terms of acid strength, all right? We can describe that two different ways. We can say, well, fluorine has the higher electronegativity, so, you know, bond X right here is really strong, or we can say F minus is not stable in solution. It's going to want to bond with that H plus again and get those seven um, electrons of fluorine, another one, so that it can have eight. So there's a lot of different ways we could describe that. Remember your binary acids, okay, um, especially the strong ones like HCl, HBr, and HI. Those are the only three strong binary acids, HCl, HBr, and HI. Um, we look, when we're talking about how strong they are, we look at uh, the bond between H and A. That's generally the most uh, important factor, right? Um, within a period, so if we're looking left to right, we're looking at the bond polarity. OK, and we know that as we go to the right, the electronegativity increases. And so the polarity of the bond should increase. Right? And that is exactly what we see. 
Uh, for our oxy acids, all right, oxy acids have an oxygen present, which um, involves an H and O and a nonmetal. Uh, things like sulfuric acid or, um, let's see, sulfurous acid, nitric acid, all those things are oxy acids. What we do when we, or how we go about kind of describing this, we look at the electronegativity of the nonmetal. So um, as the nonmetal electronegativity increases, all right, the acidity is going to increase. Right? And that's how we go about describing that. Now, if you're looking at the same other element, so instead of looking at structure like we were on the last slide, we're looking at the exact same uh, nonmetal, then we look to see who has more O's. So more O's generally means more acidic. So H2SO4, um, which has four uh, oxygen atoms present, is going to be more acidic than sulfurous acid, uh, which does not have four, it has three. So coming from sulfite, right, SO3. Um, another way you can look at it is if you know the oxidation numbers, all right, the, the higher the oxidation number, the greater the acidity. Another group um, that is going to be new to you, right, I know we talked about binary and oxy acids in first year chem. Um, a new group would be the carboxylic acids, all right, and these are going to be organic compounds that have a COOH group on them. And we say COOH, but really it looks like this. All right, that's usually how we draw it. Notice these two lone pairs up there. All right, so this can definitely engage in hydrogen bonding as well. All right, but when we look at the acidic behavior of our carboxylics, um, we can see that there is some electron density being drawn in this direction. And so one of the resonant structures that is formed here is an oxygen with a negative charge uh, because it has those three uh, lone pairs there and just a single bond. And so this is going to increase the polarity, right, of this region because we would expect this carbon to now be um, a delta positive. And uh, that is going to increase the overall acidity of this of this acid. So there is some resonance here that we want to be familiar with. Now, I know you guys aren't in organic chemistry, but I'm just going to give you a huge hint for later on down the road. Um, when you see this right here, and this is, again, nothing to do with our class, everything to do with your future. Something is going to attack right there. This is a tetrahedral shaped intermediate that we have formed. And that positive right there is going to attract somebody's, uh, we'll just say A, somebody's lone pairs. And you're going to end up making um, some kind of new substance. What usually happens is you end up, you start there, you end up with R, which is just some group. This is your intermediate. And our electrons on oxygen, right, will pop down. And this will pop off. And you'll have R, C, double bond, O to A. You can make something new there. So um, just a little organic chemistry for you that you might see one day. But it starts by learning, hey, this right here is polarized um, and acts like an acid. All right, so there you go. Now, when we're moving those electrons around, it, around, it is important to note that this is what we um, look at when we talk about Lewis acids. So if you remember way back to first year chem, we learned Arrhenius acids, we learned Bronsted-Lowry acids, and we said that Lewis acids have to do with the movement of electron pairs. And in first year chem, we don't go into great depth with that, but now that we're in AP, we need to understand it. So with Lewis acids, they are electron pair acceptors. So the carboxylic acid just now where it could accept some electrons coming into that carbon, that's what makes it an acid. A Lewis base is the electron pair donor. So if I go back to that picture I just drew, I had like R, C, double bond, O, OH. And we said that this resonates to form this. Negative charge, positive charge. OH. So since something, right, a Lewis base, 
can donate proton or donate rather electrons right there. All right. That become like this species becomes my Lewis acid and whatever is bringing those pairs in becomes my Lewis base. Now, just like all Arrhenius acids are Bronsted-Lowry acids, all right, as we move out, all Bronsted-Lowry acids are Lewis acids, all Bronsted-Lowry bases are Lewis bases, okay? And so um, that is important to know. All Lewis acids are not Bronsted-Lowry acids, though, right? It doesn't go the, the other way. So if we look at this here, we can we can see an example of this. So normally, right, if we did um, an acid, right, some some Bronsted-Lowry acid, right, which has our hydrogen here, um, ammonia is going to act as our Bronsted-Lowry base because it is going to accept that proton, right, this way. So here's the thing, though. We don't draw arrows to lone pairs. That's not um, the correct way to go about that. What's really happening here is this lone pair is attacking that hydrogen, all right, and forming this new bond right here in red. That's where that lone pair now is, right, like that. So when we look at ammonia interacting with um, BF3, we can see that, or, or we know that the F, right, um, in BF3 hogs the electrons it won't form a double bond with boron so this is a partially positive um species right here this boron is and so these two electrons this lone pair which is negative attacks that boron and it forms this new bond right right there and so since this is donating right this is donating our electron pair we call it a lewis base and since this is accepting our Lewis, or sorry, our electron pair, we call it a Lewis acid. Whew. All right. So that was a bunch. Um, if you have questions, let me know. I'll be glad to explain some of this stuff to you if, you if you have something specific that you need help with. Other than that, just keep working hard um, and let me know if you need anything.